Hello everyone. Uh, we need to talk about another uncomfortable little subject today, and that is intentional depopulation. Um, understand that the evil powers who rule over us, and uh, they, they do see themselves as illuminated or enlightened as compared to the rest of us who are dull stones, the ashlar, uh, a good image of this is the all-seeing eye in the pyramid on the $1 bill. You've got the illuminated eye at the top, the Illuminati, the, uh, the elite few who have been enlightened and received um, higher knowledge. And then there's uh, the rest of humanity represented by the bottom of the pyramid, the ashlar, the rough stone, that are basically slaves for the illuminated orders at the top. Um... Well, those people at the top, they hold to certain philosophies and uh, understand that there's not a whole lot of them as compared to the rest of humanity, and they don't need that many of us. In fact, the more the numbers of the general population grow, the more threatened the so-called Illuminati elites are uh, because one of their struggles is keeping us in check like good little cattle keeping us corralled, keeping us controlled, keeping us from realizing who's pulling the strings of power in this world and from resisting that. Because understand that these people, the rulers of the world, um, there is a conspiracy against uh, the God of heaven. Let's go to Psalm 2 because it lays this out. Uh, none of this is surprising to God at all. And he has seen how history is going to go. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Okay, so first we're focused on the masses. Why are the masses all stirred up? Why are they caught up in vanity and emptiness and these foolish philosophies? Well, it's because, verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So what's going on here? Well, the powerful people in the world don't like to acknowledge the authority of the Creator God, and so they want to break his bands and cast away his cords. What are those? Those are the, the, the laws and the moral constraints and the authority that God has over humanity, and these, uh, these arrogant rulers want to destroy the, uh, the, the proper order of things with God as the authority and humanity um, underneath him. They want to cast off God's yoke. And uh, so what does this have to do, the rulers um, establishing this conspiracy against God, what does that have to do with the masses raging and the masses being caught up in vanity? Well, um, look at what happened about 140 years ago where we had a, a massive shift in uh, what was being taught as uh, science, taught as established knowledge, uh, where we had uh, Rockefeller and Rothschild conspiring to um, control and establish public education systems in, um, in Europe and in the United States for the purposes of uh, teaching their worldview to the masses. And then uh, Freemasons also claimed that they had a part in the uh, public education system and setting that up. And um, you have, uh, you know, universities and stuff that are also pushing very particular worldviews on people and essentially brainwashing people. You have uh, the media, which tells people what to think. You have the government, which tells people what to think and how to behave. Uh, you have the entertainment industry like Hollywood, uh, which is deeply steeped in occultism and other uh, very dark spiritual things um, that is influencing people. You have these celebrities who are themselves brainwashed and mind programmed and shallow, empty people, but because they're glamorous, uh, these musicians, these actors, and these other personalities wield tremendous influence over the masses and the masses emulate them and try to behave the same way. Understand that the kings of the earth and the rulers, they're against the Lord. And they don't want anyone else. They don't want the common people worshiping the God of heaven. They don't want to be reminded of the existence of the God of heaven at all. 
So we've got Darwinism, we've got communism, we've got Marxism, we've got humanism, we have all these world systems that those elites uh, and false religious systems as well that the elites have established to erase knowledge of the God of heaven. And uh, if they can do that, if they can destroy God's word, if they can destroy God's people, and they can destroy any memory of the God of heaven, of Jesus Christ, um, they believe that they can win against God in a practical sense, just by cutting that link between heaven and earth. So that's really what's, uh, these people at the top, you know, um, they've been described as, and they are, Luciferians. They're Luciferian in several different senses. There are some who actually worship Lucifer by name, uh, the Masonic uh, secret society and other secret societies actually believe that Lucifer is a intermediary between the higher angels and humanity, and he's a benefactor to humanity, supposedly. Um, a very twisted view of Lucifer. They see him as a Promethean figure or a light bringer or a patron of humanity. Um, and so there are, yes, actually people who um, worship Lucifer. And uh, this is why you have, you know, Christian Bale, uh, as he's accepting some uh, acting award, saying that he would like to thank Lucifer. He's a Luciferian. Um, and there are many other high-profile um, people in this world, actors, politicians, musicians, uh, world leaders, and others who are actually Luciferians and who, um, you know, see Lucifer as a, uh, a light bringer and a good force, a source of enlightenment. Um, but then there are Luciferians in the sense of they're just rebelling like Lucifer or Satan did against uh, the Most High God, against the Creator, and uh, trying to establish their throne and their rule above God. Um, some of these may not even believe in a, a real devil or a real Lucifer as an entity, but um, they're Luciferian in the sense that they're following that same path of rebellion and essentially making themselves gods in place of God. And these people... Uh, understand something about those who rule over us. Think about the United States and our political system, where uh, as long as you meet certain criteria, you can run for office and even become president. Um, it's a very open political system. It's supposed to be of the people, by the people, for the people. It doesn't really work out that way. And the reason is this. The people aren't very vigilant. You know, we're caught up in our, our normal, everyday lives. We have bills to pay. We have our kids to take care of and so forth. And, um, Got to go work. Got to make that money. Um, you know, the average person is concerned about their family and their their life concerns, survival, basically. Uh, and so really it's these, the people who gravitate towards politics and uh, achieving these positions of power are psychopaths. People who just believe that they are superior to the rest of us and that they deserve to rule over us and who want power um, at any cost, and they'll do anything to get it. And so naturally, uh, kind of like uh, your toilet, um, the filth rises to the surface sometimes in our political system. And these psychopaths naturally gravitate towards government, and uh, they've infiltrated it. And so the people who rule us now are Luciferians and organized crime. And then just a lot of people who are self-serving, self-seeking, uh, narcissistic, um, awful, awful people. And when I say organized crime, I do mean that quite literally. So understand that, you know, during the Depression era and Prohibition and stuff, you had these mobsters and they were at odds with the government and there would sometimes be shootouts and manhunts. You had Dillinger, you had um, these characters like the Barrow Gang, uh, Bonnie and Clyde and others. Um, the organized crime families and the cartels, and the Italian mafia, and so forth, these people slowly began to realize why fight government all the time when in an open society like the United States, we can become government. And then uh, we, we won't have this conflict anymore. We'll be able to do our operations unimpeded. And that's exactly what has happened. And so today, organized crime have their, their fingers in government, and so do a whole variety of other corrupt actors, big pharma, uh, big tech, uh, the military-industrial complex, 
secret societies. Um, but understand the families that rule over us, uh, they, are, they are basically organized crime families. The Shaneys, the Romneys, the Bushes, the Obamas, the Pelosi's, the Clintons, the Bidens, um, they're crime families. And uh, this is why they're in such a fervor over Donald Trump. Now, I do, I'm going to say this, I suspect that Donald Trump is a Freemason, a Scottish Rite Freemason. I don't have proof on that necessarily, but he has many associates who are Freemasons, and uh, he has talked about studying Kabbalah in one of his books. So I think he's at least curious about it or has looked into it. Um so he may not be, you know, what we would think of as a, a completely good guy, but he is not, um, he's not an insider, which is why they are often so desperate to uh, both sides, both sides of the political game. Uh, the Republicans and the Democrats are desperate to keep him out. Unless, of course, there's a whole other psyop going on here where, uh, and it's very possible, I know people who believe this, who think that it's all theater, and they're making Donald Trump the underdog and priming him for a miraculous comeback so that he can be the man and then take the establishment agenda to the next level. That could be happening, certainly. I don't really know. We'll have to wait and see. Um, but understand that the, uh, the tendrils and the reins of power and this evil establishment that controls the American government, and not just the American government, but the world government via the UN and the... Uh, the um, World Health Organization, all these other globalist entities, um, it is a bipartisan. Uh, it is a bipartisan thing. So you know, I don't describe myself as a Republican, although most of my life I've voted um, conservative or Republican. Um, I do consider myself to be a political independent, and I understand that both political parties at this point are corrupted uh, completely through and through, and they are not interested in. Representing the people, they're interested in ceaseless foreign wars and making money for themselves at the people's expense. But the Georgia Guidestones is really a, um, it's been described as a, a satanic monument or a uh, globalist New World Order monument. Um, so it's been destroyed now. But this was erected anonymously. Uh, it was quite expensive to build, I'm sure. Um, granite monument had these four um, big slabs. There were these tenets written on it in multiple languages, um, some ancient languages and some modern. And um, it was erected in Georgia, and there was a euphemism on it as to who had erected it, um, R.C. Christian, if I remember correctly. So there's been a lot of speculation as to what that means. And there are some people who believe they have identified a couple of the people who are behind this monument. I'm not going to dig into all of that today. We're going to keep it fairly basic. Um, and you can research this on your own if you're interested. But R.C. Christian, who was that? Um, the best theory that I've heard thus far is that uh, it was a euphemism for Rosicrucians, which is a secret society that's all about, um, to my knowledge, preserving a certain bloodline for uh, various various eventual purposes. Um, but, uh, you know, whether a secret society put this up or an organization, I don't know. There was a note on the monument about a group of American businessmen who wanted to guide um, the direction that humanity was going, uh, being behind the construction of this monument. And there are some tenets on there, the uh, Satanic Ten Commandments, so to speak, uh, which uh, we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, in July 2022, the monument was uh, was bombed, and one of these pillars was uh, heavily damaged, and then um, the establishment came and destroyed the rest of the monument, uh, according to this article, the same day, um, which is actually kind of crazy to think about. And so there's thoughts of, well, was it some American patriot who had bombed this thing? Or um, was it bombed by, you know, the same people who uh, put it up as an excuse to just take it down and erase it so it wouldn't be a testament to some of the things that the establishment has planned for us going forward? Um, 
don't know. Supposedly, there's also a time capsule under this thing, but no evidence of it was found when they, uh, they raised it to the ground, according to this Wikipedia article, which is interesting. Very interesting. So I wonder if there's some things there that could have given away some hidden truths, and maybe they just decided to quietly erase this. And this really was not covered much at all um, by mainstream media, which is absolutely insane to think about. Um, you know, you had a monument bombed on American soil. Uh, now, it, it was on private property and everything. It was a private monument, sure. But um, this was a pretty well-known thing in, uh, you know, truther and conspiracy theory uh, circles. Um, would have made a great story, but it was very much quite hush-hushed, you know. Um, and I'm sure there are reasons behind that. So there's still a lot of question marks about this. Um, Let's go down to uh, some of the things that were on this monument because it's really interesting. So this was written in multiple languages on the monument. Maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. That's really what I want to talk about here today because this is a video about depopulation. And this is one of the, uh, the major goals of the Luciferian elites or the Illuminati or whatever you want to call them, uh, these degenerates who rule over us. Guide reproduction wisely, improving fitness and diversity. Eugenics. Unite humanity with a living new language. Double speak, double think. <laughs> Rule passion, faith, tradition, and all things with tempered reason. Secular humanism. Scientism. Protect people and nations with fair laws and just courts. Global governance. Uh, you know, globalism, uh, new world order, let all nations rule internally, resolving external disputes, disputes in a world court. Okay. More globalism, more new world order stuff, avoid petty laws and useless officials, um, balance personal rights with social duties, prize truth, beauty, love, seeking harmony with the infinite, be not a cancer on the earth, leave room for nature, leave room for nature. Okay, well, let's talk about some of these things. Uh, so firstly, maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. So currently we are told there are approximately 8 billion people on the face of the earth. That does mean if we're going to get to this goal, that somehow the establishment has to trim down 15 out of every 16 people, if I'm doing my math correctly. And um, there are a myriad of ways that in establishment insiders have talked um, abortion. It's why the establishment sees abortion as a sacred sacrament. Um, or, you know, like one-child policies that some of these countries are rolling out. Um, they, uh, they don't want more kids to be born, you know? Uh, they want to keep those the population down. They want to trim things down. And then, of course, there's war and man-made famines um, and man-made bioweapons and diseases. Um, so Ukraine, uh, it is my understanding that almost a million men, Ukrainian men, have died in, over there now at this point. And many millions, I believe it's over 10 million, have fled the country. Um, and then just historically, you see these corrupt governments uh, who have had ideals like Darwinism, Marxism, Communism, Bolshevism. Um, these totalitarian governments, what is one of the hallmarks uh, of these governments and one of the things that they do? Mass purges of people that they consider to be undesirable. And then going hand in hand with that, suppression of those who uh, produce their own food and are self-sufficient. Uh, for example, there was the Hollow Demor in Ukraine, uh, where there were these Ukrainian, uh, they weren't tremendously wealthy, but they were peasant farmers, and they were able to self-sustain and produce a lot of food. And so they were basically massacred um, to, uh, you know, make people uh, more dependent on government and to get rid of people who were uh, too self-sufficient. We see in South Africa right now, the Boer, who are they? Well, they're, they're, they're self-sufficient, independent farmers. Uh, they're also white people. And um, 
now you see this rallying cry of kill the boar popping up, you know, um, where um, the government of South Africa has been captured by uh, other people, and there, there are groups ac actively going out and trying to massacre uh, these white farmers. Same pattern all over the world. Destroy people's food independence, make them dependent on government, and then ultimately when the famine rolls around, which is going to be government-created, uh, government-orchestrated, then of course the government, are they actually going to feed you and your family? No, no they're not. They're going to let you die off because that's the point. They want to get humanity down to 500 million or less. Why? Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, firstly, these people are Luciferians and they are being influenced by evil spiritual powers. You have Satan. Anything that God does or establishes, Satan opposes. He hates God. He hates God's works. And he especially hates humanity because we're created in God's image. If Satan had his way, he would kill every living thing on this earth and recreate life in his own image if he could do so. That's what he, he is and what he does. He's a destroyer. Understand that one of God's uh, mandates or purposes for humanity, let's go back to Genesis 1, was to be fruitful, multiply, and replenish or fill the earth. Um, here, let's see if we've got it here. Yeah, here we go. Genesis 1, 28. And God blessed them, humanity. And God said unto them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Humanity is unique. We've got producers, we've got consumers in, uh, in the natural world. Um, humans are a consumer manager. And uh, you can just see that in our interactions with nature. Now, because we are a fallen humanity, we often do not, um, we don't exercise this mandate very well. We are not good stewards of the earth that God has given us. And that's a really sad thing. Uh, but um, God did give us dominion over living things and over the earth itself. And, uh, you know, we are to control and use nature and, uh, and manage it. And uh, God did tell humanity to be fruitful and multiply. God loves life, and his whole purpose in creating things was that so life could proliferate and spread um, for, you know, his own pleasure. Um, the Bible tells us is why he created all things. And uh, he does want us to fill the earth. So we see in Genesis that the purpose of Adam and Eve, um, God created them, and then he placed them. Uh, so the earth was kind of a... Ooh, I don't know. Let me let me describe it this way. It was sort of a primeval wilderness. It was very beautiful, very lush, uh, great biodiversity, but it was wild. And then God placed Adam and Eve in a garden, a manicured, well-kept, well-maintained area. And that was one of their roles was to uh, manage that garden and to beautify it and to make it even more fruitful. And then you know, from this directive, we see that uh, God's purpose was for people to live in harmony with nature, and then they were going to have kids, and their kids would go out and establish their own gardens. They would uh, cultivate and clear areas and uh, manage them and manage orchards and vineyards and, um, you know, gardens of their own. And when we say garden, I don't think we just mean like a vegetable garden. I think we're talking about like a... Uh, you know, one of these uh, botanical gardens that you see in uh, these old world palaces and stuff like that. Uh, these were gardens made for not only practicality, because we do see in Garden of Eden there are fruit trees and things like that, that, you know, Adam and Eve would have been eating, but for beauty. Um, so God wanted people to go out and exercise their creativity and beautify the earth and live in harmony with nature, um, is what this directive seems to be. And the Creator God is not a fool. Um, so studies have been done, and uh, these don't get talked about very much, but um, that suggests that this earth realm could sustain 60 to 80 million people if we were properly managing our resources and taking care of uh, our water and uh, all the arable land um, that we have on earth. So uh, at 8 billion people, we're only at the 10% mark. 
this Earth can sustain a much bigger population. So the very first research paper that I ever wrote was um, about food and uh, how governments use food as a means of control. They weaponize it. And what's really interesting about that is, uh, so food aid, the United States sends out a lot of food aid to all these nations around the world, even nations which are our enemies, which is pretty interesting. And then this food aid goes to, in many cases, corrupt totalitarian regimes, and they only keep the food and distribute it to supporters of those totalitarian regimes, and they let everyone else starve and die. And uh, enough grain... Now think about that. Enough grain is produced every year to feed the world population twice over. Grain alone, so we're not even talking other food sources like uh, fruits, like vegetables, like meats, like uh, algae and fungi and other and fish and uh, poultry. Um, this uh, this Earth realm is a bountiful place, and the Creator specifically designed it to be that way. It's a habitation, and it is for humanity to use. So these globalists who want to just sort of cordon off these private, you know, government lands where nobody's allowed to go, um, you know, it's like Robin Hood and Sherwood Forest all, read, all over again, you know, no one is allowed to hunt in the king's land upon pain of death. That's not how God intended it. He intended us to live close to nature and to utilize those resources. Um, and God's not a fool. There's more than enough to support humanity for the foreseeable future uh, for thousands of more, more years. Without us having to do anything about balancing the population, all we have to do is manage the resources that we've been given in a responsible manner. And the world governments, because of human greed and the broken worldview of these, of these stupid, stupid satanic elites, so-called, um, is a result of a great deal of human suffering, and despite having tons of food, more than enough to feed everybody, there's a, a, a great deal of waste um, and mismanagement of those food resources, and millions of people starve to death every year. And it's absolutely tragic. But uh, shouldn't surprise us, Jesus Christ said, the poor are always with you. Why is that? Because no, no matter what, you, you know, there's plenty of good humanitarian... Um, people who are trying to help out with world hunger and, you know, things like that, homelessness and all this. But ultimately, the thing that drives poverty and all these other evils and ills is ultimately human nature and human greed. And uh, humanity can't solve that problem on its own. That's why, um, you know, the Bible tells us we need, a, we need a savior. We need to be cleansed from our sins, that sin nature uh, that is a cancer and has a, a the effect of entropy and decay upon this world and upon uh, human society and human institutions and human endeavors. Um, anyway, weaponizing food. What's really interesting, so I talked in my recent video about the horsemen of the apocalypse, how I believe they are the lead up to the tribulation period, and how I believe we are actually there right now. And uh, it's, it's fascinating. This uh, Ukraine is a breadbasket, some of the most fertile land in the world. And uh, just look at this article here. The conflict in Ukraine is threatening the world's food system. For instance, Ukraine and Russia supply about 30% of global wheat and barley exports. And that's fascinating because uh, in that passage I shared with you in that other video about the horsemen of the apocalypse, Revelation 6, what are the two grains that are specifically mentioned here as being in short supply during the famine period? Um, well... And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. So what's going on there? Uh, well, you've got wheat, a very quality grain, uh, that is going for a penny. And a penny is about a day's wages. And it's one measure of wheat for a penny. That's extremely expensive. A measure is not very much. And it's three measures of barley, the cheaper, more economic grain for a penny. Uh, that is also extremely expensive. Three measures of barley is not much. And then see that thou hurt not the oil and the wine, or in other words, this voice is saying, um, <laughs> as, you know, it's like you go into a store and uh, you see a sign, you break it, you buy it. And, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're telling your kids to be real careful not to touch anything. 
because, you know, maybe there's all kinds of expensive glassware or something in there or whatever. Uh, that's the principle here. See that thou hurt not the oil and the wine, or other words, be really careful with the oil and the wine, uh, because these um, uh, are even more expensive than the wheat and the barley. So what are oil and wine? Well, there's some different interpretations of this. Oil and wine were both used for medicinal purposes, um, but then oil is also a fuel. Um, in the Middle East, at the time the scriptures were written, it was used as a cooking fuel, especially. Um, and then for like uh, oil lamps for light. And then wine is a, a luxury as well. So you could look at that and say, well, there are some things like fuel um, that are going to be really expensive as well. And then certain luxuries are going to be just incredibly expensive in this famine, famine period of the so-called four horsemen of the apocalypse mentioned in Revelation 6. But it is interesting that uh, the conflict in Ukraine is threatening uh, wheat and barley specifically. Uh, and those are the grains mentioned there in Revelation. I want to talk a little bit about, uh, about Thomas Malthus. Well, before we get to that, uh, let's also just say, so Revelation 6, the book of Revelation talks about some terrible things as we approach the end of history as we know it. So the four horsemen of the apocalypse, um, under them, a quarter of the Earth's population is going to die. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. Uh, so the four horsemen are, as I see it, uh, so you have the first one with the crown and the bow. So he's got an airborne weapon and he's wearing the corona. So what is this? I do see this as man-made bioweapons and, uh, and plagues. Uh, the second is um, war, world war, taking peace from the earth. The third is famine. And then the fourth one is just death. And I see this as being a cumul cumulative effect of the prior three. Um, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. So all these uh, horrors are ultimately going to kill a quarter of earth's population. So we're told there's 8 billion people, so 2 billion are going to die um, in the lead up to the end times. And then during some of the plagues of the tribulation itself, we see that a third of the population is being wiped out. So, you know, you're going from 8 you're, uh, you're losing a quarter, so we're down to 6 billion people. And then from 6, you're losing a further third later on in Revelation, so now you're down to half. Uh, we talked about how some of those who rule over this world system are Luciferians, and like Satan, uh, they just hate people. They see, uh, many of them see themselves and their bloodlines. So uh, there's, uh, there's a book about the 13 Illuminati families. And I don't really, it's really hard to verify this stuff. Um, I will say that the book is, uh, the one I was reading anyway, was very well researched and it was tied in exceedingly well with American history. And because of those connections, it had a, a great credibility to it. Um, however, you really just don't know uh, with some of this stuff. It's hard to, to verify it. But this book mentioned that there are these 13 Illuminati bloodlines, not families necessarily, but actual bloodlines, each bloodline represented by potentially several families. And, um, you know, they, they think that they are above the rest of us, that we are subhuman, and that they, through their centuries of practicing magic and uh, blood rituals, that they have purified and uh, accumulated spiritual power in their bloodline and they are godlike and superior to the rest of us. And, um, and you know, there's people that just, they hate humanity. And this hatred is really uh, inspired by the same hatred that their father, the devil, Satan, uh, has for humanity as well. He's a destroyer. He's an accuser. He is Satan. And that term Satan is the adversary. The adversary of what? Of anything that God does. And God created humanity in his image. So of course Satan hates us and wants to destroy us. I want to talk about Thomas Malthus. So these Luciferian so-called elites love Thomas Malthus. Thomas Malthus, I believe, was an economist. And he postulated uh, what I call the Malthusian fallacy. 
so the Malthusian fallacy is this. Um, he postulated that production of resources um, grows in a linear fashion while population grows in an exponential fashion. And so eventually you'll hit a point where resources run out and there's not enough to feed everybody. And then bad things start happening in society. Well, the problem with this, look at when this guy lived. Uh, he died in 1834, so he died before the Industrial Revolution. He died before modern agricultural techniques and mechanization and, uh, you know, the internal combustion engine and fertilizers and GMO foods and um, all this other stuff um, that uh, irrigation techniques and land reclamation and hydroponics and... Uh, vertical farming and this guy was before all this stuff so one thing that he never considered in his worldview was um, that uh, technology could actually multiply the productivity of a hectare of ground by a significant amount and so yeah population is going to expand but um, the food supply can be expanded as well through technology and uh, even just through more people deciding to use more arable land because there's plenty of land out there. Uh, some of it just needs to be, you know, reclaimed and managed and so forth. Um, there's a lot of land that uh, even something simple like just irrigating it would, uh, given time and the proper irrigation and fertilization, would make that land arable again. Um, yeah, there's a lot of desert area in the in the world but uh, you could change those deserts with uh, a very little bit of effort so this guy and that's why i call this the malthusian fallacy because it's kind of a doomsday scenario that this guy postulated but i mean he lived 200 years he died almost 200 years ago um so he wasn't operating on the on the best information and as i mentioned you know around the turn of the last century around the turn of the year 2000 um enough grain was being produced to feed the entire world population twice over. Grains alone. So Malthus, this is, is his, his thinking was a fallacy. It was just incorrect. He, uh, he didn't have all the, the information available to him. But those who run this world, they love the Malthusian fallacy, and they use it as a justification for this depopulation. And you still hear this talked about, that population is exploding and it's out of control and we don't have enough resources to feed everybody. No, no, that's, that's all lies. It's all lies for the purpose of justifying depopulation. And uh, some of you are, have already started thinking ahead. Um, have you been paying attention to what's going on in society with the uh, homosexual agenda and with the trans agenda? And things like that, and uh, and now you have these couples who are what's what's the term? Oh man, I've been seeing these videos online. And it's just it's disgusting. I think they call themselves dinks. They're these couples who uh, they're very intentional that they're never going to have children. They're just going to go and live the good life for themselves, and they are proud about it. And they call themselves dinks. I'm pretty sure. And, uh, yeah. Um, those in power have done a great job of conditioning people to think that children are an, uh, an evil and a blight on this world. That's exactly the opposite of what God says. God says children are a gift from God, and um, blessed is the man who has a lot of them. Uh, the Bible says that uh, children are like arrows in the hand of a mighty man. So ask yourself a question. If you're a mighty man, a warrior, how many arrows do you want if you're going into battle? Do you want just one arrow? <laughs> That's not going to help you out too much. Do you want just three arrows? Uh, when we're talking about arrows and you're about to go into a, a warfare situation or even just hunting, um, the more arrows you have, the better, because that's just more opportunities. Uh, and so, you know, um, this is why historically uh, Bible-believing Christians have held to the view that, yeah, children are an inheritance of the Lord and a great blessing, and the more you have, the better. And uh, so you do see Christians who have had big families. And, you know, the more I've been thinking about this, um, I do like kids, but I, uh, I have some health issues. I'm not tremendously energetic. Um, you know, just trying to survive and pay the bills is tough enough. Um, 
I've thought of a, a lot about whether I want to have kids or not, and uh, I like the idea of it, but it it is it does involve some sacrifice and a lot of hard work, and it's a big time commitment. It surely is if you're doing it right, and especially now, if I were to have kids, I would want to homeschool them. Um, I would not I would not trust my children's minds to uh, this world system. Um, so it's a huge sacrifice to have kids. And uh, I think I've come to the conclusion, and, you know, this may not even be possible. I'm single, so I haven't even, you know, hit the, reached the first step yet of finding uh, a good woman. Um, but, uh, you know, the best legacy that, uh, that you can leave this world is having a large family, lots of kids, and training and teaching them well. That is the best le legacy that you could possibly have. That is the biggest impact that you could have on the world. Because the vast majority of us, we're never going to be great scientists or great inventors or great statesmen or great you know, generals, great conquerors. Um, but what you can do is you can succeed and thrive at the ordinary things. You can have a huge family. You can raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, teach them discernment so that they can tell truth from deception, and, uh, well, you know, teach them how to defend themselves, how to use a rifle. <laughs> and um, doing that is probably the, uh, the most impactful thing that you, could, that you could do to have a positive uh, influence on this broken world that we live in. I don't know if, uh, if there's going to be enough time to do that. I don't know if things are about to descend into chaos right now, uh, coming up soon in the next couple of years. I think it's highly likely. So I don't know. I may have missed my opportunity to, uh, you know, find a good wife and uh, have a family. But um, if I'm given that opportunity, uh, I would, I'd really like to have a big family with a lot of kids because uh, that is one of the directives that God gave to humanity. Uh, kids are a challenge, certainly, but they're also a blessing. And uh, and that is an entirely opposite philosophy to this disgusting Luciferian garbage that's being pushed on us from above. Well, thank you for your time. I hope that this has been an interesting video and has given you some things to think about and to look into for yourself. Have a great weekend. Have a great rest of 2023. And uh, be safe as the new year approaches. All right. Talk to you guys later.